Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Um, welcome to Boost Your Build, our Masterclass 2.0. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're super, super excited to be here with all of you today on this fine evening. Um, we at Booster Builds, our mission is to elevate and uh, educate and elevate the development industry. As we all know, we are living through some very unprecedented times now with uh, rezoning that is happening, um, or like the the talk of rezoning, I should say, it hasn't quite happened yet. And uh, also, you know, with the housing crisis, there's going to be a lot of development in the upcoming while. So. Our team here is really focused on just making sure that um, as a development industry, we have the tools and knowledge and skill set to execute projects at a very high level and at a very high quality. Um, so diving in tonight to the content, we are going to be focusing on mastering Calgary multifamily development um, and a step by step guide. Uh, Dan, can you just uh, move the slides over a little bit? We're going to be focusing on multi-family multi development, and quite specifically the zonings of RCG, HGO, and MC. So if we look at our next slide here for a second, I will say that uh, for those of you who have attended our previous events, um, you will notice that all of the topics that we cover have something to do with the development process um, in Calgary. Uh, more specifically to do with the multifamily world. Um, this, in a nutshell, this slide represents basically all the high-level steps that you need to take in order to execute any project successfully. Now, that being said, this is like a lot of content, so we're not going to cover all of it tonight. But just so you know that all of our future, um, not just um, tonight's session, but our future sessions will be covering a lot of the topics that are actually represented here on this slide. Um, so make sure you follow us on um, our social feeds and, you know, our boosterbuilds.ca is our, um, our website. Dan, can you go to the next slide, please? And yeah, just if you want to save the date for our next um, major event. Oh, I just see, sorry, there's a typo there. April 30th, 2024 um, is going to be our next Masterclass 3.0. Um, we're going to touch on it very lightly tonight. Uh, for, but for those of you who are not aware, April 22nd is a very big date in the city of Calgary uh, because city council will be going to make a decision on the blanket rezoning for RCG. So our master class 3.0 was very specifically designed to be roughly about a week after that happens. And we're going to be, regardless of whether or not, yes, it's a go or no, it is not, um, we are going to be hosting a session on now what, depending on what the result is. So we please save the date. Again, that's April 30th, 2024. Sorry, that's not April 3rd, it's April 30th. That should read, um, yeah. So without further ado, we are actually going to dive in. Uh, before uh, before we dive in, I'll just do a quick intro of myself. My name is Kathy Ewan. I am the founder and CEO of Phase One Design. We've been around for 17 years. That makes me feel really old. Um, but we as a firm and our team have been involved in literally thousands and thousands of inner city developments and more recently, multifamily developments as it relates to the RCG, MC, and HGO zoning. So today we are going to deep dive into the whole process step by step and take everybody through um, all those different steps that were presented. Um, oh, sorry, not not all those steps, but as it relates to the overall process, we're going to do a deep dive. Our first speaker up is Justin Worthy, owner of New Builds Calgary. So Justin is um, really top of his game. He's done over half a billion dollar in sales volume on the real estate side. But what I really love about working with Justin is, and as it relates to tonight, is he actually has 18 years of um, experience as a real estate investor. So he not only understands the realty side, but he also understands the finance side of things. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Justin. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kathy. I appreciate it. Um, and welcome to everybody who is on the webinar tonight. We're excited to deliver some um, high value content that you can take from tonight and use it moving forward. So um, if we could please move to my next slide, that would be great. 
So developing a strategy um, before you get involved in any project in new construction, as I'm sure a lot of the people on uh, today's webinar can attest to, developing a strategy is so, so, so important. Um, so many people, when they're getting into building, they buy a parcel of land and they're like, yes, I got a piece of land. And then they're like, wait, now what? <laughs> so I think it's really important to develop a, a strategy up front and figure out like when you get your land parcel, um, what, it, what is the next step? So if we can go into the next slide, Diane, that would be great. So when it comes to looking for land, um, always thinking about what kind of land is it that you're looking for. And so reverse engineering your pro forma. And so are you looking for an RCG lot? Are you looking for an RCG corner? Are you like looking for an H go lot mid block? Um, are you looking for an MC1, an MC2, et cetera? And what is your business model? Um, and, and stay in your lane to a certain extent. So um, there's a lot of builders that, that I um, speak to on a day-to-day -day basis and they, they all have a slightly different business model, but making sure that you stick to the business model that you know best. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're somebody that's used to building duplexes, it's not great to maybe buy a, an MC2 lot where you can build 200 homes right off the bat, because then, you know, you're not used to that kind of build form, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I don't have to tell you guys about that. But with that being said, um, there's a lot less um, activity on mid block lots right now. And so what we're trying to encourage builders to look at is mid block lots and maybe RC1, maybe RC2 that would need or, or could get a potential rezone to RCG if this um, citywide rezone happens or potentially to an HGO if it's in um, you know close proximity to um, public transit, et cetera. So, um, you know, trying to find those diamonds in the rough, if you will, and not looking for the lot or the land that everybody else is after as well. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide as well too, please, Diane. So what's happening in Calgary real estate? Um, as you may or may not be aware, Calgary metro area population just hit 1.64 million people, um, 1,662 listings on the market as of today. Number of sales in the last 30 days, 2,189. Um, and there's been a rental increase in the last 12 months of 14.3%. What does that tell us? Um, that tells us that in Calgary, we need more housing options. Um, and so the citywide rezone will help with that. And also builders like yourselves um, coming together and figuring out how can we, how can we build more doors um, and be more efficient with our buildings. So um, that's something that we're going to talk about a little bit more and strategies that surround that. So um, without further ado, um, Diane, if you could go to the next slide. I'd like to welcome back Kathy Ewan and Colin Schwalter with Bliss Home Designs and Phase One Design to speak to us about the next step in the process. Unmute. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. That's awesome. Um, and uh, before we move on, I just want to introduce Colin Schwalzer. He is with Bliss Home Designs. And uh, Colin comes from a very extensive both construction and design background. He has 20 years in construction and another 10 years just specifically to do with design. So he is the face of Bliss Home Designs. And I will pass that over to you now, Colin. Yeah, cool, Dan. If you can go to the next slide, that'd be great. <clears throat> All right, so land acquisition and identifying the right parcel. I think we're going to probably start to sound a little bit like a broken record tonight because, you know, the, the the focus is always the same, is is identifying the right parcel or, or approach for your project. Um, that is something that starts before you even buy land. Uh, be proactive. You know, that process starts very early on. So I think if we go to the next slide, Diane, please. <clears throat> So, I mean, like Justin mentioned, like what type of property are you looking for? That is gonna kind of go hand in hand with what type of project are you looking to build? Um, whether it's a rental purpose built thing, uh, a project or something that you're looking at selling down the road, uh, your strategy might change on what type of property you have and depending on your level of uh, expertise and comfort with uh, this type of investment. Um, so, you know, when you decide, am I gonna do a single family dwelling or a semi-detached? Semi, uh, semi um, you know, fourplex, sixplex, eightplex, that kind of stuff. Those numbers are all going to go back straight to your performer. 
um, you know, to determine what's going to be the uh, best use for the property that you choose. But we can start to look at those things and identify them before you even purchase a property so that you kind of have some of that stuff figured out before you've actually made a financial commitment. Um, next slide, please, Dan. <clears throat> Um, obviously, uh, you need to align with the design um, <clears throat> partner early. Uh, experts in general, any business you're running, you want to surround yourself with experts. So this, the, the, more, uh, er, the earlier on in the process that you can uh, involve a design team, uh, we're going to be able to do things for you like, you know, a quick bylaw review, building code checks, um, start to help you kind of identify some risks uh, in the project. Uh, and those nuances is design and the timelines, that kind of stuff. And then on this property, there's two ways to look at every property, right? This is what you can currently do. If you go down to a rezone, then this is what you will be able to do. So there's always two different approaches to everything as well. So the sooner you can align yourself with sort of experts that understand um, what the possibilities are there, they can start to help you uh, de-risk your project and start to make your uh, pro forma more dialed in so you know exactly what the parameters are going to be as you go through construction. Um, next slide. All right. I think this is you, Kathy. Yeah. So um, Colin mentioned risks. So with any sort of business or development, we all know that risk and a risk assessment is something that we always want to look at. So I'm just going to touch briefly on what that might look like for an inner city development. Um, next slide, please. So we all know, uh, actually, you know what, it's funny, we almost deleted the slide, uh, because we're like, yeah, that that doesn't really happen. Because to be honest, um, your rezoning and your development permit, although yes, let me let me just start with saying, um, every project has risk, obviously, the rezone and the development permit process. So if you are working through it in the correct manner and with the right team, it should actually be fairly low risk. So how that would work is at the very, very beginning of the project, like even before you buy land, uh, your, your design partner and your rezone partner, regardless of who that is, if they're experienced, they should be able to look at a parcel and say, yeah, you know what? That's a really high likelihood of success in terms of getting the rezone and the development permit approved. Or on the flip side, they might say, oh, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. There might be an issue here. And let me give you an example. So, um, you know, this is not something you can just find on Google or uh, somewhere on the Internet. But throughout the years, um, experienced people in the industry know that there are certain communities that have a higher level of community engagement and involvement. And that's not a bad thing whatsoever. As a matter of fact, we encourage community engagement. But there are certain communities out there that we just know, you know what, there's no way that a fourplex is ever going to fly here. So don't even bother. Like, don't even try. I mean, you can if you want, but it's going to be a waste of your time and money. So things like that, um, we you want to identify early on. Next slide, please, Diane. Here's uh, also a quick list of, you know, kind of things that anybody developing in the inner city and everybody here tonight should be mindful of. These are not necessarily bad things for your development. They are just things that if you see them, you should kind of say, oh, oh, hang on a second. That might be something that is either going to cost me more time, more money, or perhaps you just need to approach your project in a slightly different way. So I'll just kind of quickly touch on these. Um, so NMAX power poles or lines, usually you can just do a visual inspection of your property and see that. Trees, so private trees, you more or less can do um, what you wish with private trees that are on your private property. Any trees that are on public property within six meters of your property, you do need to protect them. And if you do not, um, you need to pay for them. And the value of those trees can be anywhere from $500, $500 to, I've seen as high as $30,000 and anything in between. So you want to make sure that's not a, uh-oh, 30K bill. Um, asbestos abatement, I've seen uh, anywhere from, you know, it ranges from 5,000 to anywhere up to, again, I've seen bills that are, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, depending on the level of asbestos, demolishing the existing house, moving it off the foundation. That one's pretty straightforward. You obviously need to uh, move the house, but just make sure you have that in your performa. Curb cut rehabilitations, uh, if they exist and you're not reusing them. Um, these last three things are more specific to multifamily. DSSP stands for Development Site Servicing Plan. So essentially, uh, this is a civil engineer document that you need to get and submit with your development permit. Um, the reason why this is important for everyone to know about is that um, 
there are sometimes things that come back from the development or sorry, from the DSSP that are going to cost you money. So for example, managing your uh, storm, your, your drainage off of your site, sometimes as an example, you need to actually uh, have that water stay on your site in the form of an underground tank, which can be quite costly. So just making sure you build that into your performa. Uh, fire rating versus a firewall, there is a difference there. So, you know, anytime you're doing more than four units, you do require a masonry firewall. So making sure that that's built in your construction cost. And depending on how you do your mechanical systems, when you start getting into multifamily units, you know, let's just say a fourplex with four suites below, are you doing four mechanical systems? Or sometimes we're uh, seeing projects that have eight. So just making sure you're building those costs into your performa. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to pass uh, this off to Ahmed. So just a quick intro on Ahmed. So Ahmed is our financing guru when it comes to projects like this. Um, Ahmed is highly experienced. He has 15 years of commercial mortgage broker experience. Um, what I also love about Ahmed is he has 13 years of actually doing real, real estate investing and development himself. Uh, so he has on the ground experience. Um, and what's really cool as well, I thought this was a cool fact about Ahmed. For four years in a row, his company was nominated as CMA Canadian Broker of the Year. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to Ahmed. Thank you so much, Kathy, for the fantastic introduction. And um, thank you, Justin and Kathy, both for your uh, knowledge and um, everything you've shared so far. I know uh, we're going to be hearing from you again, so I cannot wait. Um, so uh, this is our second webinar. Our first one, we sort of touched on the uh, financing uh, for MLI Select, um, and we talked about the program in kind of a, a broad uh, spectrum. So today, uh, what I really want to do is I want to focus the conversation for builders so you can get the most value out of this. But at the same time, um, I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about what the program has to offer in a general way without getting into it too much. And then I'm going to jump into some really cool builder uh, knowledge. So... So um, introduction to uh, CMHC multifamily for builders. So uh, the, the program for CMHC, um, obviously it gives you um, uh, the financing for the project itself, but for builders, it also gives you construction financing in the beginning of the project. So, uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, um, uh, for the uh, program offerings, which is the next slide, we uh, we'll jump right into that. So program offerings, as mentioned, uh, I'll touch on that very briefly. So we're talking MLI Select program, which is the biggest buzz right now. Um, it's The program came out in March 2022. And what it's offering is 95% loan to value. It's offering up to 50 year amortization and it's offering uh, lower premiums than the standard because not many people know this, but CMHC multifamily has been around for a long time, but they never had 95%, they had 85%. They never had 50 years, they had maximum 40 years. And then the premiums, which just like when you buy a house at 5% down, you CMHC adds the premium at funding. It's the same thing for CMHC multifamily but the premium is lower. Lower as in it's 2.55%, as low as, uh, as opposed to the standard stream, which is over 5%. Seems like a lot, but the fact that the program is also giving you some of the best interest rate we've seen compared to residential mortgages today, if you wanna buy a house to live in, um, we were funding deals at 4.95 and 4.65 three weeks ago, and if you follow the bond rate like I do, you'll see that it is starting to drop again, which is fantastic news. So next slide, please. So MLI select categories. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on that one, but the three MLI select categories are uh, accessibility, meaning uh, building something with um, compliance to accessibility for handicapped, 
uh, and things like that. The second one is energy efficiency. Um, uh, the, so the program you have to, if you reach 100 points, that's when you get the maximum utilization of the program. You can't actually get 100% in energy alone. Um, you can get uh, uh, a little bit, I'm not sure, 30 or 50 points. Uh, but some people have used uh, a little bit of the energy and a little bit of the affordability or sometimes all affordability. So energy efficiency, again, building the building uh, in the energy efficient. So, you know, uh, more uh, you know, triple pane windows or uh, higher efficiency boiler, things like that. Uh, there are reports, uh, third party companies that do these kind of reports. And uh, that's how uh, you decide what you're building or what you're improving if it's existing. Third, um, and next slide for that one as well. So third category is affordability. Affordability is the most popular category right now. That's what everybody is kind of um, uh, uh, using most of the time. 95% uh, of the applications that we see, and we see a new application every week and a half to two weeks since March 2022 has been affordability. And uh, it's pretty simple. For Alberta, uh, based on the median income of Albertans, we've decided that affordability rate is around 1735. And uh, CMHC, they want to see 15 to 25 percent of the uh, units uh, and square footage uh, rented at the affordability rate. So that's why you see this beautiful fourplex in front of you with four legal suites. People will use those legal suites that can probably be only rented for 1600 to 1750 in normal circumstances for the affordability because that uh, doesn't impact your performa as much as you'd think. Uh, or not at all um, in some cases, and uh, you're still able to achieve the 100 points of affordability with just 15 to 25% of your units, and that's why most people just don't jump in affordability. So this is a little bit about the MLI Select program. Now I wanted to jump into the builder portion, so please, uh, on the next slide. All right, so required documentation for construction. So if um, whether you do construction with CMHC or not, which will be the next slide, um, the documents for construction uh, when you go to CMHC um, will be uh, the same for a construction mortgage, but a, a little more. So you'll still need your site plan, your development permit, and your building permit, which are normal in every circumstance. You'll need a budget and a construction schedule that outlines uh, approximately when you're planning to reach each stage of construction from breaking the ground to lock up to drywall, finishing that sort of stuff. And uh, you'll need an appraisal, uh, but the appraisal has to be from an AACI designated appraiser. So that's a commercial designated appraiser. Um, if you are building more than six units, so seven plus, you have to provide a phase one environmental report, whether you're doing construction or just buying a place. So this applies to all applications as well as the appraisal. And uh, finally, if we do construction with CMHC, there's a beautiful report that is a pain called a QS report. Usually we use this report for larger projects, as in I'm talking seven plus 10 million plus projects. But even if you're building a three or $2 million project, you need a QS, which is a cost consultant. This report is probably around 4,000, I'd say. And um, what it does is uh, the cost consultant will look at your budget. They will quantify your budget, um, as in, is your quantities correct? They'll look at uh, the first at least 60% of your project and even try to get quotes for that to see that you know your framing quote is correct. Um, obviously your framing uh, material, which is the quantity part is correct. Uh, you know, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, they'll the look at the entire budget. So once they do that, that is what you're gonna base your draws on with CMHC. So every time you need a draw with CMHC, you'll call this QS guy he'll go down and we have a list of you know, approved QS companies with CMHC. He will take pictures of the site. He'll take a copy of your budget, which you are responsible to show everything you've paid for to date 
Sometimes they'll ask for invoices to show that it's been paid. Um, they don't get too uh, deep in your bank statements and things like that, only to prove the equity that is in. Meaning, remember when I said 95%, meaning that you need to put 5% of your own money in, usually that's already in the land. So that's, that, that's kind of an easy part because the program is such high leverage. Um, the QS will also make sure all the stamps are there, um, you know, from engineers or architects, uh, depending on the stage of construction. And that's the report that will be submitted to CMHC every time you need a draw, which will cost you four to $800 after the report, just to get a draw. So again, this is very common for larger projects, but for CMHC smaller projects, um, that's what we're seeing. So now brings me to what we're looking at on this slide, construction CMHC versus conventional. So construction with CMHC, obviously it, it, it's very document intensive. And you know the reality of things is these days, um, prop, um, projects under 10 million, they're, they're being looked at differently because lenders just don't want to do it. So that takes away 90% of the lenders that would take a CMHC approval and give you a construction mortgage. Um, it is important to note that the interest rate during construction is completely different than that beautiful 4.5 or 5% that you get at the end. During construction, you're going to be paying anywhere from prime minus one if you're over 10 million to prime plus 1.5 if you're around 2 million. Or prime plus 0.8 is kind of the sweet spot that I've, I've seen most of the approvals coming at. The lenders want 1.5% fee. Uh, which is not uh, a fee that you would pay for if uh, you go directly just for takeout, no construction with CMHC. So this is a lender-specific fee because they're managing the construction of your project and looking at the QS reports and doing all this admin stuff. So that is construction with CMHC um, uh, and the differences between the takeout. Now, and, and that's maybe just a personal opinion, I... I, I I prefer to do construction away from CMHC for smaller projects, uh, especially because the long waiting time to get approved, um, you know, we're talking minimum four months and the lender won't advance any money until we show them that golden ticket called the COI certificate of insurance that you're approved. So, um, you know, uh, the difference between an eight and an eight and a half rate, if you get conventional or private financing, uh, you might be at nine and a half to 10 and a half interest. So you're paying a little bit more in interest. Again, um, you're not getting 95%. You're probably going to get 75% of your budget. So you might have to put a little bit more money during construction uh, period in the project. Um, the fees are probably around the same. So you don't lose anything there. But the main thing is you get money right away. And that is one of the biggest things that I see with my builder clients is that cash flow and getting money on time and right away is very important. With CMHC, it is very patient. So if you're expecting to get a construction mortgage with CMHC in a month, it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, there are circumstances where CMHC construction makes sense and conventional construction makes sense. So that's a kind of a longer conversation. But I kind of wanted to touch on the fact that there is another alternative and you don't have to do construction with CMHC. The takeout is beautiful. Of course, we have to do the takeout with CMHC because nothing can be 50 year amortization. The alternative is 25 years with any other bank and uh, over 7% interest rate. So uh, no matter if you're thinking, oh, the premiums are high or the application fees are high, that is all kind of absorbed and you will be in a surplus position within the first year and a half. Um, so, uh, that is pretty much it for the construction um, and the conventional private part. The last thing I wanted to say to leave you guys with is when builders out, out there, you don't own the land yet and you're buying land, CMHC won't even consider your application until we're 100% complete. So um, at least development permit approved, they might be patient with the DSSP part and the builder uh, uh, building permit part. But we cannot go to CMHC without the all our appraisals, third-party reports as an environmental QS. 
So there are alternatives to buying land at that time um, uh, before going to CMHC. So just wanted to give you some options is that, you know, we have clients that um, they say, okay, we want the best rate. Uh, okay, so go to your bank, get 20% down, buy a piece of land with a house on it. Hopefully it has a house on it, rent it out, call it a rental property. That buys you time to do your soft costs and your rezoning. I can't get approved with conventional. I don't, you know, um, uh, claim enough money on NOAs. A uh, lot of self-employed people have that problem. So that's when we go private. So you're going to have to pay nine and a half uh, to 10 and a half percent, put 25 to 35% down. And that will buy you that time and that bridge until we're ready to go to CMHC. Um, or like I said, if we do go to the private conventional part, we can just roll that uh, land purchase into construction right away as soon as your DP is approved. So I hope that I gave some value uh, to our builders and uh, other people in the panel today. Um, and I'll pass it back to, uh, I believe, uh, Kathy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ahmed. And uh, I just want to mention as well that after our presentation at about 545, we're going to finish the more formal part of our presentation and we're going to open the floor up for Q&A. So if you just want to drop all and any questions into the chat, we will definitely be addressing them live um, once we're finished the presentations. All right. So um, yeah, back to Colin and I. So after the financing piece and after you have your land secured, uh, then the next step is design and permits. So design is fun, permits is not. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna I'm, we're gonna be approaching this segment of the presentation from through the lens of more of a like an investment standpoint and a builder and developer uh, standpoint. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please, Diane. So I'm not gonna deep dive into you know the details of what the permits are and like the process and everything like that. I'm just gonna keep it really high level. But one thing that's really important, in my opinion, for any client to know and anyone here tonight is how to choose between what we call a safer permitted development permit versus what we call a riskier, it's, it's a discretionary permit. So if we go to the next slide, we have an image that actually shows the difference between the two. So on your left-hand side there, we have what's called a discretionary development permit. This is what we would deem as a standard development permit. So, you know, you, we submit the permit, the city does a review, um, there's cir circulation of third-party stakeholders being your community association, your counselor, and essentially anybody in the public is allowed to comment on your particular application. Um, as an applicant, uh, the, working on behalf of our clients, we need to address the comments back from all parties, including the City of Calgary. And then at some point, a decision will be made to either approve or reject the application. And with a discretionary permit, you have the advertising and appeal period. So it's a four week period where literally anybody in the City of Calgary can actually appeal your development permit application. Assuming that's successful, your permit gets released. And then the next step would be a building permit, which is what you actually need in order to start construction. And then you're off to the races. So that whole process on the left-hand side there for the discretionary development permit, that in total takes anywhere from 12 to 72 weeks. Now, if you compare it to the right-hand side, that flow chart talks about um, a permitted or contextual development permit. The, the Verbiage is a little bit different um, depending on what type of building you're doing. But if you look at this particular flow chart, it has more or less all of the same steps. So you submit, you uh, do the review with the city or the city does a review of your application. You address any of their comments. You actually skip the third party stakeholder circulation piece. And then they come to a decision without any advertising and appeal period. And then your permit gets released. And then you're off to the races um, with your building permit and starting construction. So if you go to the next slide, please, Dan. So the difference here is what's highlighted in red. So those two pieces right there that you see in red are the two areas of the process where your project is more at risk just because there is public consultation. And again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It just means that your project will take slightly longer and it, 
could mean that, you know, your, your project is subject to appeal if somebody wanted to appeal it. Now, there's no right or wrong in terms of what type of permit you use. Very often, I would say that we do take our clients down the path of the discretionary development permit. And there's very specific reasons why you typically end up getting more for your development if you go that pathway. But there is an alternate route where you do do the permitted development permit. And not only does it fast track your development, but it actually de-risks it from a permitting standpoint. So again, just taking this back high level again, for the purposes of everybody here tonight, you don't need to know all the different, like all the details of what the, that process um, entails. The takeaway here is that there are two different types of development permits that you can get for any sort of inner city project, including multiplexes. And you just need to understand the risk and time frame differences between the two. Next slide, please, Dan. Yeah, um, so a lot of people ask what the differences between all the zones are, what they can build. I mean, um, each one obviously has a bylaw page that's uh, multi pages long, but um, on a high level, we'll kind of go through each of these uh, pertinent zones. Um, and then there's an option whether you want to change the zones, do a land use redesignation so that you can get something else on that property than what's currently permitted. Um, so RCG, HCO, MC, these are going to be the most common zones that you're going to see these multifamily developments on. They're the most likely ones that you're going to be um, searching for, or potentially, I guess you could see an RC1 that's going to, you're going to want to rezone up to an RCG or RC2. Um, but yes, so <clears throat> the difference between the zones. Um, so RCG zoning typically is a four unit with four suites uh, on a standard 50 by 120 lot. Uh, sorry, I guess we should say switch slides here. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I'm on the next slide actually, uh, Diane, sorry. A little ahead of you, yep. So, yeah, so typically we see four units up, four units down, which is like a townhouse style. Um, 50 by 120 lots, obviously, are, are pretty standard sizes. Um, we also see these on inside lots, especially in certain communities around Calgary. There are uh, some inside lots that are already zoned um, RCG. And as Kathy sort of touched on, there's a potential for a blanket rezoning on April 22nd. Um, which means after that, we may be able to, you know, do um, certain things uh, on multiple inside lots in, in, in uh, many different neighborhoods more than uh, there is now. So those are going to be a potential opportunity for us going forward. Can you go to the next slide, please, Dan? <clears throat> All right, HGO. Um, so typically you see four by fours, very similar to um, the RCGs. These are on 50 by 120s as lots, uh, 50 by 120 lots as well. Um, there is a potential to do five by five um, units, and uh, there's there's some unique ways to do that. The nice thing about HGO opposed to RCG is that this actually has no density. So um, it really comes down to the parking requirement based on the, the width of the lot on the 50 foot width. So, um, and again, on HGOs, they are really specific to location. Um, so a certain number of lots around the city have been already identified by these parameters. Um, the local area pl pr plan supports HGO zoning uh, in certain neighborhoods. And then if it's within 200 meters of a main train station um, or a main street, a 600 meters of a train station, 400 of, of a bus or 200 of primary transit, those are the criteria of uh, qualifying for HGO. So typically, if you're looking at like rezoning, you're likely going to only have one or two options. And it really all comes back again to the pro forma on uh, how many units you need on that pro property in order to make the numbers work for your, for your investment. So um, can you go to the next slide, please, Diane? <clears throat> all right. So the MC zoning... Um, Typically, this is still four by four units, um, row house inside lots usually have a little more flexibility on design because now they don't have a lot coverage calculation. It's a, it's a different calculation um, and they ha uh, have some amenity space requirements as well. So um, you do have to accommodate some of the property to have more amenity spaces than you do in others. So um, all three of those zones obviously have sort of pros and cons, but all of them are going to be able to accommodate, uh, you know, multifamily um, building like we've been kind of talking about here today. So 
Um, so uh, Diane, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, which one's best? I mean, it really is gonna come down to, you're probably not gonna have a whole bunch of choices. The lot's either gonna be already zoned or it's gonna be eligible one way or another to, to some type of um, zoning, whether it's a, a RCG or H4 or MC. Um, what we do is we have uh, partners uh, that we consult with um, as well to get you know more um, comfort level on which zone is going to be more likely accepted by the city when we get down that path and that sort of thing. So um, there's lots of ways to approach this, but uh, we definitely uh, try to bring in the whole team to give us some um, perspective on what's going to be the best path forward. So um, Diane, if you go to the next slide, we have a couple just examples here. <clears throat> I think Kathy, you're going to talk through these or do you want me to do this one? I forget. Doesn't matter. I <laughs> yeah. So there were, there's some examples of some corner uh, projects that we, that we have here that kind of fit on any of these. I don't know. You can talk more on Kathy. Yeah, I can, I can go through some of the details if you like. Yeah. So um, like Colin mentioned, the, we get this question all the time. So RCG, HCO, MC, they're more or less generally the same, but it's it, the devil's in the details, right? So they all have their nuances. Um, we thought it would be good just to kind of show some examples of what you, you could build. So starting with a corner uh, fourplex, we call these four plus four. So basically what that means is four units up and then four secondary suites below. So if you're actually selling the property, you can you have four doors to sell. But then if you're renting, you have eight doors. Um, so with these on a typical 50 by 120 your square footage ends up somewhere around 1300 to 1400 square feet above grade. Um, your bedroom count is typically either two beds, two plus den or a three bedroom. The determining factor of what you design on that upper floor really um, mainly comes down to what your exit strategy is, which Justin is going to be talking about after we're done our piece here. Um, if you just go to the next slide, please, Diane. So the just one thing I also want to mention, we get this question a lot as well. Uh, what design style can you do? Um, regardless of the zoning, there is no architectural controls per se that control the design style of anything you do inner city. Um, so you can do something really traditional or really modern or somewhere in between. Um, there is obviously things like building height, which sometimes forces your roof lines and things like that. Um, but yeah, you can do any architectural style. So this is just an example of a modern style. If you go to the next slide, please, Diane. Um, also, I want to just, just show an example of fourplex done in a different way. So those first two that you saw were designed for corner lots. Now, when you get into inside lots, obviously there's way more of them than corner lots. And uh, so typically how you would set up a lot like this, there's a few different ways, but the most common way that you see, sorry, I know the black ones are kind of small, but we call, we call them four packs. So you have two units in the front, two units in the back, they're attached in one building. And then you have secondary suites that are under each building or sorry, under each unit, I should say. And usually your parking is always off of the lane, uh, the back rear lane, and you can either do them as surface stalls or you can do them as inside stalls. So, and there's a few different ways that you can do like your garages and things like that. Um, but generally speaking, that's what you would see on an inside lot. Um, there's tons of different ways you can actually do these types of projects. If you wanna, we're not gonna spend, a whole bunch of time looking through a bunch of designs, but if you want to check out our uh, Bliss Homes uh, pre-design collection of multiplexes, that's the QR code that just so will take you to the website and our website address as well. Next slide, please, Dan. Okay, awesome. So we've talked a lot about permits and just what you can put on a lot design-wise. Just wanted to uh, touch on this one item with regards to timelines. This is something that I think a lot of people miss in their development. So just wanted to share this for everybody here tonight. Um, so the timing of any project, it's like a race. So like the minute you get your lot, it's like, okay, ready, set, go. And you just wanna go fast because literally time is money in any sort of construction project, but especially in an investor led development. So the key thing to know here with this particular slide is the timing of your, um, 
demolition permit versus your development permit and your building permit. So let me just explain like the permits here for a second. So your development permit, we already talked about, that's like the one that takes a long, um, you know, months call it. So once you get through that development permit process, you're going to have a develop a DP approval. And then after your DP approval, you're going to get your building permit. So your building permit is like your holy grail. This is what you need to start construction. So that's what everybody's looking for when they start a project. But the building permit allows you to start construction. What a lot of people miss is that kind of in the background on the right hand side of the slide, in order to get your building permit, you actually need a demolition permit. So a demolition permit takes roughly about 30 days to get because what's involved in your demolition permit, you first need to apply for it. Then you need to disconnect all of your services because you're demolishing the house. Obviously, you can't have services going to the old house. And then, um, and then, uh, yeah, so you have to disconnect your services and then you need to go back to the city with a bunch of paperwork. So that whole process takes about 30 days. Now, even before you apply for that dem demolition permit, usually you would have a renter in that house. So you need to make sure that you actually time this whole thing correctly so that your renter, you're giving enough notice just based on your um, uh, tenant agreement to actually get them out of the house and have them um, ev vacate the property before you can actually start the process on the right hand side. But as you can see from the bottom, um, where it says building permit and there's uh, the demo permit like on the right hand side of that, you actually need the demolition permit approved before you can actually get the building permit. So these two funnels all funnel down to your building permit and you need to just make sure that your timing works out so that you have your demolition permit in hand so that you can you don't delay your own construction start. But it actually starts all the way up here, which is basically um, vacating the property. If I you just want to emphasize that point, Kathy, because I've had conversations with uh, builders. Uh, I bet you once a day the last couple of weeks where you know it's you're asking them, do you have a tenant in there? Yeah, yeah, no problem, but it's month to month. Well, you know what? You still have to get them out before you can start this demo permit submission. Yeah. So it's something that a lot of people don't realize, and it ends up delaying you for a month if you don't time that properly. So I think it's a good point of emphasis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. And then now that you started construction, uh, you know, we're going to fast forward the process to exit strategy. So Justin's going to take the stage again and walk us through that. Awesome. Great information, everybody. Thanks for everything that everybody shared. Um, really, really great value. So um, I even learned a couple more things here too, even though we rehearsed it a few times. So thanks again for that. And um, now speaking to execution and exit strategies, um, and what do we mean by that? Um, so big picture, what it means is beginning with the end in mind. So um, going into a project and making sure that you know um, you know, when you're starting the project and you're managing the build process, you have um, an exit strategy utilized. So is that purpose built rental? Is that for sale? And if it's for sale, are you going to be planning on doing a pre-sale type application? Are you going to be waiting till it's finished completion, et cetera? And um, also just evaluating whether it makes sense to rent for a period of 10 years um, through MLI Select. And then your exit strategy could be to sell and really making sure you build out that pro forma accordingly. Um, so Diane, if you could please go to the next slide. So we've helped our builders put together a very detailed construction pro forma um, to figure out exactly if the land acquisition makes sense for them. Um, and again, beginning with the end in mind. So having all of your soft costs and hard costs dialed in at the beginning of a project before you even purchase your land acquisition. So all you need to do when you find land that you're interested in is plug in the cost of the land, um, talk to your realtor partner, make sure that you have um, somebody that is very, very um, kind of tuned into the market in the inner city and new construction and, and figure out exactly what your, um, what your ARV or ABV um, values are. So after you've built what, what value you're expected to sell for so that you can determine um, to a very close dollar, what your what your pro, uh, profits are going to be at the end. So, and if you do want access to this, um, hit us up. My email is at the bottom there. I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, and then next slide, please. And then if you are going to do a rental model, making sure that you have a pro forma like the one that we have displayed on the on the screen, figuring out what is the ROI, what is the cap rate, et cetera, so that we can help you or your realtor partner can help you um, basically advertise this to investors um, that would purchase it as 
a project, all eight units, et cetera, um, or to really know what uh, what your numbers are on the on the on the build side, so that if you do go for a, a resale or, or sale model, that you can determine what your profits are there as well. So just really making sure that you begin the project with the end in mind is super super important and something that a lot of builders overlook. And then if we could go to the next slide, please. So these are a few different things that we've, or a few different models that we've helped other builders with. Um, and so basically renting it for a period of 10 years and then selling it like we had talked about, and especially in an up market like today, that would make some sense. Um, selling eight units to one buyer right off the bat. So basically doing your construction financing like Ahmed had talked about, and then having the investor um, basically get their MLI select financing in order as you go through construction and then selling it to them on completion or selling four units with basement suites to buyers um, one at a time. So four different buyers and why that makes some sense is because with these basement suites, it really opens up your buyer pool to more buyers and you can ask a little bit of a higher value for each unit um, for that reason. So I, I just think that those three different models are ones that would make um, a lot of sense for, for any builder looking at this uh, type of business model. Next slide, please. All right, so we are going to go to our Q&A portion of our presentation. So um, I'm literally just gonna start at the top and just go down. So uh, I'll start with the first question. Would love to see a basic Performa template for townhomes. So um, Justin, I think I just heard you mention you're happy to share that Performa. You just dropped on the screen there. So if you just want to uh, send Justin an email, he will share that with uh, you via email. Um, question here. I don't know if we can answer this question because uh, we don't have a builder on the panel. But uh, what is the rough construction budget for a four up and a four down building? Kathy, I think Ahmed uh, answered Ahmed. it next. So right. yeah. Mm -hmm. I can answer that just based on experience with other builder budgets. Um, so for four up, four down, depending if it's a two story or a four story, not including land, you're looking at um, soft cost and hard cost. Again, depend on the financing you have. I've seen everything from 1.7 to about 2.2 uh, for a construction budget. And that's for a four up, four down uh, plus land. So again, depending, um, you have project management fees. Uh, are you project uh, project man uh, site supervising yourself? Uh, is your financing cheap? Are you building cash? Um, are you buying materials cheap or you're buying retail? So a lot of things will go into factor. And um, that's why, um, you know, make sure you know what you're doing or you hire a builder. Awesome. Um, next question. What is the most typical mechanical setup, again, for the four up and four down? and system type for basement. Um, I can take that. Or Colin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I've seen it both ways. So it, it really, I think it can be either way. Um, Kathy, I'm sure you've seen it both ways as well. Yeah, there is a code requirement that your mechanical system has to be accessible from both. Like, so let's just say you have an above grade unit with a basement suite below. So with in, in that one um, dwelling or the two dwelling units, both dwelling units need to be able to have access to a mechanical room. Mm -hmm. And kind of like the the sanity test on that is okay if like let's say a breaker goes or something and you need to access it, both tenants need to be able to access that. So yeah, we've done them and seen them where it's a shared mechanical room with both of them, but then we've also done them separate. Um with regards to the type of system, we've done them mostly for stair, but then we've also seen them done with electric as well in the basement. So not really a right or wrong, it just really depends on the build the, the, and the builder. Okay, next question. Uh, do, Justin, what is your email? Okay, Justin's email is right on the screen there. Um, please confirm numbers are with land. I think that the, that's a question for you, Amit. Please confirm numbers are with land. So, um, so the numbers I just spoke about were not uh, does not do not include land. So uh, I I don't know what you're gonna buy a land for, or maybe you've owned it, you paid for cheap land. So that's a question for Justin. What uh, how much can I buy land for? But 
1.7 to 2.2 kind of average of what I've seen the construction for a fourplex with four legal suites. Yeah, and to speak to the cost of land as well, too, on top of that, um, it really depends on your location. Uh, we're seeing land vary um, in price from, say, 600 or so in in um, newer developed, er or not newer developed areas, but areas that are just starting to be gentrified. Um, and then we're seeing other ones uh, as high as $1.1, $1.2 million for a 50-foot lot in the communities that um, are a little bit more, um, I guess, desirable or or more gentrified over time. Okay. Um, Justin, I think this question is for you. Um, with the uh, challenge of finding land right now, um, do you have any tips for finding great, great land? Justin, that's probably a good one for you. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so one thing that I I'm recommending for people right now is trying to focus in areas that a lot of other people are not focused. So right now, everybody is talking about corner lots, corner lots, corner lots. Um, but when corner lots come to market, there's 5, 10, 15, 20 bids on it. And it's just not a great way to get a good deal. Um, and so what we're what we're recommending is is working with a real estate team that has access to off market land acquisitions. Um, so, for instance, our team goes door knocking door to door to find um, land for, for our builders and developers. So I think that's a really great way to uh, to access land that a lot of people aren't looking for. Plus, also looking in communities that maybe haven't really gentrified as much as others. Um, for instance, um, I sold an RCG lot in Forest Lawn a couple of weeks ago for 525000 mid-block, 50 by 120. Um, yes, it might be in a less desirable location, but it's a lot more affordable, good for rental, and potentially you could carve out your own little market niche um, where, you can, where you can sell uh, townhouse property in say forest lawn areas, et cetera. All right, I think, thanks, Justin. Uh, Ahmed, I think this question would be for you. Can I use my first project to qualify for a second project? Um, so I'm assuming they're, we're, they're asking about uh, net worth requirements. So um, this is what we spoke about probably more last time. So when you qualify for CMHC, you, you need a minimum 100,000 uh, net worth and 25% uh, of the project, so greater of obviously. So if you are getting a mortgage for 2 million, you need positive net worth for 500,000. Um, because the first project has probably been leveraged to the maximum allowed, nothing above the maximum can be used as equity um, for net worth. So no, you cannot uh, use the 5% of equity you have in the first project as a net worth requirement. Okay, thanks, Amit. Um, next question, Colin, you're probably the best one to answer this. Do we need a DP approved before we can apply for a demolition permit? Uh, no, you can. You do not need that uh, approved. You need the DP. Uh, sorry, you need the demo permit approved before you can apply for your building permit. Okay, awesome. Uh, Amin, this one, back to you. Are there any restrictions on the CMHC multifamily construction program if you were to buy a piece of land with a tenanted house on it? Um, so, like I said, um, CMHC won't finance anything until you're ready to go for construction. So assuming you're asking if, the, uh, if there's a tenant uh, in a house that you're going to demolish, then CMHC is not even applicable. But if you're talking about you're buying a CMHC multifamily that exists with tenants, of course you can buy that. So I'm not sure exactly what the question was, but like I said, CMHC does not get involved until you're 100% ready to go. So your house would have probably been demolished without a tenant at that time. Okay, awesome. Um, this one, uh... For Colin, Colin, when rezoning land, can DP and BP run concurrent to save time? Or do we need to wait for rezoning approvals then apply for DP? I think that's 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure that it's uh, worded correctly, but um, so DP and rezone can be run concurrently and then you'll have a condition of DP will be the actual finalized rezone. So yes, you can you can run those concurrently, a rezone and, and DP. Yeah, and then just to kind of tag on to what Colin's saying, you do need an approved and released DP though before you can actually apply for your building permit. Um, just as a side note to your building permit, the nice thing about that is the day that you actually go in to apply for your building permit, you can do what's called a partial permit. And that partial permit will actually allow you to start construction. You can dig your hole, um, go all the way up to, um, you know, backfill, and you can cap your foundation. So to top of main floor, sub floor, and then you need to stop construction up until then. But that usually buys you like quite a bit of time on the front end of your project. So just thought I'd add that. Um, Next question, Ahmed, can I sell my project once I finish building it? Are there any restrictions? Um, so that's very important because Justin and I know how that can restrict somebody from uh, cashing out when they want to. So let's say you um, build a project um, and you are able to sell it for 3.3 million. Yes, you can sell it as long as whoever buys the project if you already have CMHC financing, that they will assume the same criteria that you agreed with CMHC with, because most likely you uh, agreed to sign a 10 or 20 year with CMHC at the station that you will keep those units at the affordable level of 17, 30 and below. So you have to buy it based on those factors. So if the builder, now this is where sometimes it gets tricky. If the builder already got a CMHC financing and he got a super cheap mortgage, he's like, I don't want that much of a mortgage. I don't only want a $2.5 million mortgage. But you can legitimately get a sale for 3.5 if you didn't have a CMHC. So now whoever assumes your mortgage has to put a million dollars to assume your 2.5 mortgage. So keep that in mind. If mm -hmm. You, you want better cash flow, that's understandable. You want a construction mortgage with CMHC, that's understandable. But if you're going to take that takeout mortgage, you're going to restrict yourself from the next person buying it if you don't maximize that mortgage so they can put their 5% down payment. So, Yeah, and I agree. And if I can tag on to that too, um, also just, just um, thinking when you start the project, like how how are you going to do this and beginning with the start with the end in mind and just being like hey am i going to be selling this or am i going to be holding this because the way that you finance the project is going to be different depending on which way you want to go yeah awesome really really good questions um i just want to be mindful of the time it's six o'clock right now so the panelists we're just going to keep going with a q a but for anyone who actually needs to leave i just want to point out that all of our contact information is on that on the slide that's um up right now so feel free to reach out to any of us directly if you have to run um but the we're just all going to stay here just continue answering questions until um, uh, thanks for joining us yeah and thank you all right so i'm just going to keep rolling on these questions justin is it realistic in the current market to try to buy off market land conditional upon rezoning and dp approval yeah. Wow. That's a good question. Um, uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm just, kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding, but yeah, you know what, we can, we can try that. It really depends on the motivation of the seller. Um, and because, you know, there isn't everybody and their dog competing for this lot. Um, I would say that the opportunity for that is possible, um, but potentially not probable. All right. Um, oh, this is a really good one. Ah, okay, Colin, I know what you're going to say about this one, but I'll ask it so everybody else can hear it. I have an inner city property that we would like to rezone to RCG. Should we start the conventional rezone process now with the city of Calgary or wait to see if the blanket RCG coverage gets approved in April? Yeah, I mean, I would just say it's it's a really straightforward answer is that uh, waiting is not going to change anything because what's going to happen is that if you start now, you're going to be ahead of the queue. If, if there's a rush at, at the DP office to, you know, get a bunch of DPs through once, you know, this rezone, if it does go through, well, you're going to be now in the lineup with everybody else. 
Um, I also think that when you're looking at a financial investment like this, you definitely need to consider what are the actual laws today or bylaws today. And as of today, you know, it's not in our CG. So, you know, start that process as fast as you can and, and, you know, get ahead of that curve if it comes or that wave. Yeah. And just to talk about that April 22nd date a bit more, you know, like we're very careful to share our personal opinions of what we think is going to happen. But there is a lot of indicators pointing to that, you know, it is going to get uh, pushed through, like even just if you go and dig the history of, you know, the council votes, like it's, it's, it's almost split half and half, but there's definitely some motivation for the city itself, you know, all politics aside to kind of push it through. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's that. All right, Kathy, I think we should add on to that, though. I was just going to, you and I talked about it earlier today, is that we, we've had builders or investors call us and saying, should we start buying up these RC1 lots? Because then we'll mm -hmm. be able to put up an Aplex there once this goes through with the city. You know, keep in mind that if it does go through, everything's going to still be discretionary typically, yeah. right, on this stuff. So that doesn't mean you'll be able to build what you want, right? So um, let's keep that in mind as well. Yeah. And even um, just to kind of shed a bit more light on that April 22nd day, so like, even it, let's just say that it is, it's a go. Like they, they basically say, yeah, it's approved. The blanket rezone. There is still a ninety day, like nine zero day period with which they, um, the city will take before it actually hits by law, where um, everybody can start taking applications. So that actually brings us to the date. If you do the math of August the seventh. So what we think is going to happen is like you know there's going to be a lineup of people trying to hit that August 7th date, but there is actually another pathway uh, strategically that we're doing with our clients where we're submitting development permits now and you won't be able to get it approved until August 7th, but at least you are already in the queue and your DP would be basically have just a condition on it subject to the rezoning that would happen. So automatically, assuming that the rezone goes through automatically on August 7th, or I guess it would be August 8th or somewhere in around there, your DP would then get released versus like, you know, then you're, you're, you're gaining all of that time if you were to do it right now. All right. Um, can I start the project with private or conventional funding and switch to CMHC prior to construction completion? Yes. All right. <laughs> is that all you, is there anything else you want to add to that? I guess that's a pretty straightforward. Yes, yeah, it's a pretty straightforward question. Answers two different people at the same time. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, sidebar, will we have access to this recording after the webinar? Yes, we will be posting this on YouTube within, um, shortly after uh with respect to self-employed individuals are there any major barriers to getting financially approved for land mortgages and construction mortgages um so for self-employed individuals that don't um pay a lot of uh, dividends or t4 income to noa personal income like 90 percent of my clients um there's a lot of options for that. So for land mortgages and construction mortgages, um, we're obviously not going to go to your conventional bank because we can't qualify now for a rental property. We can go to private lenders to close on the on the land at 25 to 35% down of the land purchase price and get a mortgage from nine to 10 and a half. will be an open mortgage, so there's no penalties at least. And we can transfer that into a, either a construction mortgage with a private lender, same rates, or to CMHC if we choose to go to that route. So no, there's no, uh, for CMHC, it's, you know, the harder or the bigger the financing, the more common sense it is. It's not just a bunch of robots making little check marks. So at that level, it's about net worth, right? Do you have the age, the experience, property management experience? Are you gonna hire a property manager experience and 25% net worth? That is really the only income-ish um, qualification for this and just to be a kind of a decent person on credit, you know, on Equifax. I mean, if they pull it up, you don't have uh, judgments and a whole bunch of stuff, then you're you're good. In my experience, we've never had issues. All right. Um, is there any way to waive the QS requirement? Only if you don't get construction financing with CMHC. If you get a private construction mortgage, yes. But with CMHC, no way. They always okay. want the QS. They love their paperwork. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Is there any, oh, whoops, I already read that one. Is there a limit to the amount of properties you can do with CMHC? No, the more the better. They, they like a lot. It just increases the net worth requirement, right? So you can finance a 300 unit building, but you need enough directors or maybe the one really rich person that has a 25% net worth in the uh, as part of the ownership directors slash shareholders. So. Okay. Um, the, is the concrete firewall, is that a new building code? Why can't we just frame a typical party wall? You want me to take that one, Colin, or you want to take that one? All right. So, um, there's a difference between a party wall and, you know, what we call it the firewall. So essentially when you're doing a multifamily building, as it relates to building code, anything over four units is, uh, bumps into something called part three of the building code, which basically it, it's just a bunch of other stuff that you need that you typically do not want to go into. So you need to sprinkle your building. You need professional involvement, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. Like it's just a bunch of costs and time that you, that you don't need to incur if you know how to keep it under a part nine building. So what a fire, the concrete firewall is basically something that is a mix. It's a masonry firewall that has a certain fire rating and it actually splits. So let's just say if you're doing four units up, four units down, technically by building code, that's an eight unit building. So you actually need a firewall in the middle of that building. So it's actually a four unit and a four unit. So that's what the firewall is for. Um, when you talk about the typical party wall, completely understand what you mean by that. So typically, let's just say as an example, if you do a duplex, you do a typical party wall construction, which is the frames, um, construction, staggered studs, uh, but yeah, wood framing with a type X fire rated drywall, both sides and then some other details, but those you would still need to do between your units, but that wouldn't be considered a firewall. It has a different fire rating. So yeah, you would need both is a short answer on anything that's over four doors on any sort of uh, building. Um, I think, did we hit all our ends, our questions? Oh, here we go. The last last one. One. Yeah, sorry. Uh, can I start up? Oh, oops. Sorry. How many applicants are allowed on a CCMC construction loan? Oh yeah. How? Um, I've never seen that as a problem um, in terms of uh, issues. Uh, so I, I don't think there's a uh, restriction. I mean, if I get a hundred directors on a company, I definitely will have to ask CMHC if that's gonna be a problem or if they will charge more application fees, but I've never seen seen that happen before so but i've seen you know up 10 uh 10 people 10 persons uh building a uh high rise before and that was no issues awesome all right i think we i think we did it i think we answered all the questions okay well on behalf of the panel thank you so much to everybody again for joining us tonight and Hopefully everything and all the content that uh, we went through tonight was very high value for everybody. We are looking forward to our next event again, um, April 30th, 2024. It, that will be in a webinar format. Oh, sorry, that typo is still there. It's April 30th, 30, 2024. And we will be talking about the implications of the RCG blanket rezoning if it went forward or if it did not go forward. So either way, we have one week to put, pull together a presentation, but you know we're working with experts here. So um, we'll know that probably far in advance anyways. But uh, yeah, on behalf of all of our panelists, I would just say, like to say thank you so much for everybody's attendance today. And yeah, uh, Diane, can you just flip back to that contact slide, please? Um, I do encourage if anybody has any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. We'll kind of just leave this um, slide on here as is. And uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, again, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. See you on the next one. <laughs> Till next time. Bye.